So what they do is they then come in and they go, okay, we're going to hire 10,000 people. We don't, we don't want to be negotiating with people. So we're just going to offer you 50% or 100% of what you currently have are earning so that we're not having to worry about that. Warning, Damien Andrews' growing revenue and profit, if implemented, will put more money in your pocket. Please use with caution. Welcome to Damien Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit with international speaker and revenue and growth specialist, Damien Andrews. This is your source for practical, usable, and simple action steps that you can do every day to put more money in your pocket. And now, the host of Damien Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit, Damien Andrews. And the crowd cheers wildly to the trumpeting <laughs> blasts of elephants sliding through eyes of needles. This is Damien Andrews Growing Revenue and Profit, the program that deals with all things that puts more cash in your pocket. This is the show that handles your revenue riddles, profit puzzles, operational oddities, and culture conundrums. I am the one, the only Damien Andrews, and on today's show, it is my pleasure to welcome back the amazing, the awesome, and my good friend, Steve Sandor. Now, and the crowd cheers. Free. Exactly. <laughs> cheers wildly, the trumpets blast. Steve oh, is the CEO um, and performance business performance strategist of Inspiring Business, which you can see in his background there. Um, he helps businesses known as get back to doing the things that they love to be with the ones that they love, guiding them through the maze to a sustainable and profitable business, one that they love, one that does not rely on them. They um, He also hosts the Inspiring Business podcast, and Steve has this amazing background where he's worked with people where companies have had to compete on financial matters and he's worked in creating cultures that actually attract quality employees so business can actually perform well without having to be chasing this dollar or paying lots of dollars to have great employees it's about creating a culture about being an employer of choice which is what we're here to talk about today. G'day, Steve. It's <laughs> always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, thanks, Damien. Yeah, it's a great topic too, isn't it? Uh, in this day and age, here we are in um, May 2023 with uh, employers struggling to find quality people and uh, chasing the the dollar or trying to avoid chasing the dollar trap. So, yeah, I'd love to talk. Uh, it's a subject that I'm really passionate about. I love to talk about. I think I'm knowledgeable a little bit about it, so hopefully <laughs> I can add some value to the listener. Oh, I wouldn't undersell yourself there, Steve. From my <laughs> of your experience, you, you'll be extremely knowledgeable on this topic uh, from where you've worked and the history, and, and we'll put the links in the show notes for the people for the previous podcast where we've talked about that in detail. No doubt we'll touch on some of that today. But you're right. I mean, today's changed. I remember when my dad was young. Um, well, maybe I don't remember so much when he was young, but I remember when he was my dad <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> today. Um, but looking at that demographic, back when we had the baby boomers, and um, which I think my dad falls into that category, there was a substantial amount, substantial, substantial, substantial amount of labor in the workforce, which meant you know, employers could be selective. They could be actually quite brutal in some places and still find people to work for them because there was such a glut of of um, uh, potential employees of people that needed work. Now, today, as we know, the demographics changed significantly. We are now moving into an aging population. Um, the boomers are retiring. Um, there's a lot less people to to work in that space. Not only that, the people that are working in that space 
are very aware of their own health, their own mental health particularly, and about having some sort of balance, which makes it challenging if you're an employer that's seeking to find that or follow that old model of you must work um, without thinking about the the mental well-being, the family life of that of your employees. Now that's where your experience, Steve, comes in because you worked in in environments where there was that high end competition where you worked in P and G, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. um, and companies would come in and they would have literally you know massive budgets. They could pay whatever they wanted to pay, but other people still had to compete. And you created environments where we go, okay, well, let's think about the employee. How important is it today? Now, when you're de- when we're dealing with this, is it to create that culture to create that quality employees? Yeah, it's a really different environment that I think none of us have have experienced a- as it is today. Right. Mm. So if you go back to uh, like I'm you, of your dad's era, you know, so mm. I'm a baby boomer or at the tail end of the baby boomer, um, and the environment in the seventies and eighties. Uh, and into the 90s, there was high inflation, but there was also massive profits. Mm. And so salaries were going through the roof, uh, mm. but people didn't really care because, you know, profits, we could pay people, but got blood out of the stone, right? So I remember yep. my first corporate role. It was expected of me to come in at six o'clock in the morning and leave at eight o'clock at night. And, Mm. I used to break my day up into two, you know, go for a swim in the morning so I could get through it. So yeah. there was a there was a massive uh, expectation that that was the badge of honour that you had. Mm. I think, you know, 30, 40 years down the track, we, we are in a different uh, societal environment. So mm. people are no longer... Uh, wanting to work the long hours uh, to be able to contribute whatever it is that they want to contribute to a business. You know, we've just gone through a pandemic. There's a massive, uh, Mm. or there was a massive exodus of people from corporate. Uh, They were talking about it being the gig economy, you know, people going into working from home for themselves, Mm. Um, I think it was more a job hop rather than an exodus. You know, people were not happy with where they were, so they took the opportunity to go jump from the firing fire into the frying pan or fire, frying pan into the fire. So mm. I don't know that that's necessarily worked out for everybody. Mm. Um, and now we're facing, you know, inflation, uh, interest rates, hikes, AI. You, you know, this whole uh, potential impact on our working environment. So people are sort of like, what I see is they've got deer in the headlights. They just don't know what to do. Mm. And so the natural thing to do is for, you know, there, there's a, there's a uh, under, uh, so there's a dearth of peop, quality people who you can find in the marketplace. And the natural tendency for people is we'll offer you more money to attract you. And that has some massive uh, impact on the existing staff that you have. Mm. So we can, we can drill into, into that. Yeah. So the environment that we're in at the moment is very, you you mentioned PNG Um, just real quick, the Mm. Exxon caravan, came through for the LNG gas project in 2015. They sent a pilot team through, 100 staff. They send another 1,000, and then that 1,000 gets ready to build the camp for 10,000 people, and then that 10,000 mm. people builds the builds the pipeline, and then they leave, right? And yeah. that takes, you know, between three to five years, depending on, you know, the environment that they're in. But in the so what they do is they then come in and they go, okay, we're going to hire 10,000 people. We don't we don't want to be negotiating with people. So we're just going to offer you 50% or 100% of what you currently have are earning so that we're not having to worry about that. And what we'll do is we'll we'll bring you and we'll train you up on what we on how we work. 
Uh, and um, and some people take the bait and survive. Others take the bait, don't make it through because they're just not prepared to, to make the effort and put mm. it in, so they'll come back. But what's left in their wake is businesses who are now scrambling to keep people mm -hmm. and they think the only way to keep them is to pay them more money mm. or they've lost them. And so what they're left with is they're left with, you know, the people who couldn't get a job mm. with the, you know, with the, with the project. So we're sort of facing something similar here at the moment. You know, you've got this, this migration of people between jobs. They see that they can earn more money because they hear that there's more money available so they'll start looking. Now, most people look because they're unhappy. Mm. You know, the, the people who are relatively happy with where they're at in terms of their satisfaction of the job, salary may be an issue, but they're likely to be able to go and have a conversation with their employer about, you know, their salary without mm. thinking about leaving. Yeah. So... The first line of defense is make sure that your existing staff that you have, that you want to keep, that you're actually treating them well, not paying them more, but you're mm. putting in place, you're creating a culture where there's a lot of uh, communication, it's open, honest, there's a lot of trust that has been built up over a period of time so that when you have these, so you can have difficult conversations or you can start to notice the subtle changes in their behavior mm -hmm. so if someone's if someone's getting ready to leave or they're thinking about leaving you'll see it in their at you know you'll see it in their attendance you'll see it in the quality of their work you'll see it in their attitude maybe they're changing you know the if uh, if you're having your weekly or daily huddles you might see a subtle change in their behavior and it's mm -hmm. at that point in time where you actually address it you now all right yeah. Damien, see that you notice that you're, you know, there's, you're not your bubbly self. There's something going on. Can we have a chat about it? Right. Yeah. And then you talk, you talk that through. So that's your first line of defense. Mm. It's actually making sure that the, qual the the people that you have and you want to keep, that you keep them. You don't have to offer them more money, but you may need to address everybody's salary, which is obviously going to have some impact on profits. The next thing is attracting quality people to, to your business. Now, everybody goes, well, we need to offer them more money. Well, not really. Not really. Because if they're going to come and join you for money, they'll leave you for money. So you're wanting that, you know, they, they need to be able to see in your business that you've created this business that is, is engaging and attractive to be in. Mm. You know, I was at an accountant's office the other day and he's done a fantastic job of creating an environment when you walk into the building, it's you you wouldn't think it was an accounting office. He's a car collector. He's okay. a he's a co collector of Porsches. Right? Yeah. And he's got this fantastic, and I don't know, it's a Porsche Carrera, but it's a very rare thing in the foyer. Wow. Of his office, right? Yeah. So cool. Yes. So cool. And and the the reception is not a reception. The reception is a coffee shop where mm -hmm. you come in and you sit down and they make you a coffee. He's got a boardroom. His office is next to the reception. Really? Everybody else is on the second or the first floor. So yeah. he's not he's not in the day-to-day -day operation. So he's extracted himself from the business, but he's there where he can actually see what's going on, who's coming in all of those mm. sorts of things. So I think that's really clever. The environment that you create has has to be something that is reflective of the values that you that you are wanting to be seen for. Mm. So that's, you know, so there's some practical things there. From that I, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go yeah, ahead. No. I was going to say from that perspective because when we're looking at that side of the equation and all of that makes sense and i think we all know that but it seems to be the reason we don't do that is because the metrics by which we measure performance doesn't account for that doesn't allow for that but because we know we look at you i mean you look at google and what do they have their rest pods and all this kind of 
stuff that they have to create this mm. amazing culture because we talk about culture conundrums how do we create a culture that people want to be that and i think we all know um either intuitively or at some level we know that appreciation um is a bigger motivator uh, in so many different ways, creating a, a fun place to be at, an enjoyable place where people feel that they're worthwhile um, makes people want to come. But it, it, we seem to know that, I believe. Yeah, that. I, I would. And is it is it a measurement thing? or I, I, I think what happens is people conflate fun and enjoyable. Right, right. So you 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 have to create something like you have to have the bean bags in the corner because we want to be like Google. Mm-hmm. No, right? No, I mean, <laughs> no we, you know <laughs> we we've had this conversation. You know, it needs to be appropriate. Yes, right? and it, it needs to be appropriate. It needs to be enjoyable. Mm-hmm. It may well be fun. It mm-hmm. may well be you know because people have a have a a fun attitude towards work, but not everybody is the life of the party. And not everybody wants mm. to work in a business where everybody is, you know, the extrovert and we're all running around, yeah, you know, doing the things. So I, I think it needs to be it needs to be enjoyable. What you know, and the enjoyment might come from the quality of the work that you do. Mm. And that might be the performance, you know, as an organization, we value the quality of the work that we put out, and we won't let this piece this widget this report whatever it is that we do we won't let it out the door until it's actually at a a certain standard that we believe matches us right Mm. that might be that that might be everybody just gets their jollies off that right that might be enjoyable Mm. i don't know you know it, it really is a bespoke type of approach depending on the environment that that you're in right yeah construction that you work in you wouldn't call that fun right like working out in a you know it's with me on a, on a <laughs> well, you know i mean so, so, someone who's working on a you know on yeah. a construction side pouring especially on a day in. like today if you're in melbourne and it's it's freezing cold oh yeah yeah, yeah. It's like, so what what can you what can you as an employer or a manager or an employee Mm. Right, so this is this is the thing that everybody goes. It's the employer's job to make your life, um, you know, pleasant. No, mm. right? No, it's a collective accountability. Okay. If you want to work in a in an environment that's fun and, and well enjoyable, and you want to be there, you need to contribute to that. You can't mm. just put your hand out all the time and go, "It's my right to be here." Right? No, it's a privilege. But is right? it? It's a, pri- but- it's a privilege. The question I'm getting to is, is is it a measurement thing? Because, I mean, it's very easy to measure profit and mm. go, okay, you know, here we've got dollars in, dollars out. You know, the difference is a profit, hopefully profit. Um, so that's an easy thing to do. But to measure when we're talking about creating a culture, and mm. as you said, yeah, it doesn't need to be beanbags. It's got to be appropriate to the organization, that, that accounting office you were talking about. And I know um, a couple of my friends who have got accounting offices and they create a very fun environment. They've got the business to where they want it to be. And it's it's um it's they have a lot of satisfied employees there that are long-term employees. But they create that environment and they also the smaller the businesses, it's probably a little bit easier because you can really be on the pulse of what's happening and, and to do that. But what about from the, if we're talking about bigger businesses creating that culture, what sort of measurement tools can they do to to go, okay, what is the employee satisfaction? Um, I don't think surveys work very well because, you know, who, when you're doing an employee survey, who gives, says, oh, it sucks here. Yeah, Some people I, I mean, they, they do. They do. Employee engagement surveys can work. Mm. The, the, when we've done them, you know, so in PNG, we used to work for businesses that had two and a half thousand employees. We'd run the, you know, we'd run mm. the engagement survey. Um, what we always said was, if you're not prepared to act on the survey, then don't do it. <laughs> yes. So if, if you're if you're just simply, you know, sending a message to people going, "Oh, we care about you," and here's the survey, and then there's no feedback on when you know did the 
survey was it completed in you know and what's where's the outcomes from it and what are the changes that are being made as a you don't have to make all of the changes but you actually mm. have to acknowledge that it's there so if, if if you don't want to make changes then don't do that right? yeah a couple of metrics that larger organizations might want to uh, uh look at one is the turnover mm. Right. So yep. turnover is even small businesses, you, mm-hmm. you know, you can see and, and you know, everybody goes, is there a number for it? No, there isn't. Because if you're working in an industry where, for example, FIFO, right, people mm-hmm. can fly in, fly out. There's a life cycle to that, right? There's mm-hmm. only, you know, I, I've done it. There's only so much you can do before yep. it actually grains on you. Yeah. You know, so that might be whatever. What is that number? It might be three, four, five years. Uh, who knows? Mm. Um, you know, if it's a more sedentary. Um, well, certainly. Know, I mean, that's a bigger factor. The the FIFO when you if you're a family person, especially young with younger children, that starts to have a big yeah. If you're single, I mean, I did that when I was was younger and single, and it was no yep. problem. It was, it was yep. a lot of fun. You fly in. I did seven weeks on, come back. Yep. Perth party because I had a lot of money because I hadn't spent anything. You know, yep. went back and that was fun then. Yeah. But then when you have children, being away from them, and yep. is that one of those measures that you need to do yeah, in those surveys? So, so mm, you can pick that information up. You don't have to do a survey to do to do that. Yeah. You, you know, the turnover is probably the first metric that you want that you want to be looking at. It, um, to be able to identify whether your business has the right culture or not. If you've got high turnover, now high turnover. What, what's the definition of high turnover? So if you've got a, an industry where it's a, a harsh industry and the, na- the the tendency is for that industry to turn over because it's harsh, like FIFO. Mm. Right. So that. That turnover rate may be significantly higher than something where people are in a more, you know, maybe they're an administration working in a city office uh, or a suburban business, et cetera. So, you know, you can't throw a blanket over all of this and just simply say if you've got a ten percent, um, if you've got a ten percent turnover rate, you're in trouble or you're okay, right? Yeah. So, and but. What you want to do is you want to be able to get some granular information. So what we used to do with larger organizations is that we would look at each of the departments. Mm. So we would we would have a look at the turnover in a department and or even a section to see mm. whether there was a turnover there. Now there might be turnover because people of their of their age. Mm. That's another factor. Yeah. Um they're demo, you know, so they're they're uh females who are then having babies so they there's a turnover rate there you know mm. w- which ones are coming back mm. um, I, I, do you have an opportunity to to be able to give them an opportunity to come back so there's all of that all, all of that what what you're trying to what and and so by changing the culture the metric that one of the metrics that you would be looking for is a re- reduction in that turnover rate because Mm -hmm. of the environment that you've created is safer for people or less less draining on them so Mm. you hang on to them longer yeah or the environment from a cultural point of view means that they want to stay and they're not they're not leaving because Mm. the cost of hiring a new staff member we did a study and it was anywhere between uh, the number was like thirty three percent to two hundred and thirteen percent of the full time uh, um, cost of that staff member mm. because you you've got to hire them right you've got to pay a recruiter you've got a uh, you've got the that person coming on board. If mm. if they're new, they're four weeks before they actually understand the, the business or understand the culture of the business, know where the toilets are, you know, know who the clients are, know where the computers are, all that sort of stuff. So there's a minimum four weeks yeah. before they become effective. You've got somebody managing that person, then prevent, mm. you know, spending their time yep. in in doing that. Then potentially, if you've hired incorrectly in six months' time, that person 
has turned out not to turn out. <laughs> and so you lose them. Yeah, right. And you start again. So and you start again, right? So yeah. it it's a massive cost. Mm. Massive cost, if you think about that. And that's straight off the bottom line. Yes. Right? That's straight off the bottom line. So that would be where I would have people looking first to see mm-hmm. that's that so that's internally again you can it's a defensive mechanism not yeah. a, so you know work in work in that place then you start to look at if there um you know what can we do to add some uh improvement on the performance of the people so that may be you look at skills and capacity so mm. you've got they're doing a job are you have you trained them to do that job? Mm. Right? Have, do they have are they at their expert best in the task that you've asked them to be expert best in? Yeah. Are they do they have all of those skills necessarily? If they don't, then it's incumbent upon you to be able to give them that. Now that might, you don't have to send them on a training program. Mm. You know, you can you can actually have somebody do internal training. So their supervisor, their job is to train that person to become an expert in that mm. area. So it's internal training. There may be, you know, they need to go and get qualifications. They may need to do some formal training. Um, it might be on the job stuff. but It just depends on the situation. A skills gap analysis is what you would do in that situation. Yeah. So you would need to know, you know, what's the what's the skills, attitudes, and experience knowledge that that person has to have, and what do they have, and where is the gap, and then you can put programs in place to be able to do that. The last that skills, piece is well. Before we move in, on to that, that skills gap analysis is that something you could add to that metrics of measuring and and have that as a regular reporting? I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be every month, but maybe every six months. Well, there's you know, human resource information systems, HRISs. They, they, mm-hmm. they are designed for larger organizations to be able to monitor that metric mm-hmm. and be able to uh, – so this is typically where the human resource department sits. Mm-hmm. It's, it's got the platform and it's, in, it's making sure that all of, the org- all of the individuals within the organization have got all of those um, – uh, you know skills in place. What I find, and I and I don't want to be seen as a human resource department basher, but what I find you know is <laughs> what what I find is that the managers of businesses. Mm. So I, when I run my leadership programs, I ask you know who's the who's the human resource manager here, and they all point to an individual. Yeah. who is the human resource manager. And I go, okay, let me ask the question differently. Who are the managers of people? Because mm-hmm. people are a human resource. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the change. And I believe that in the human resource world, they're changing that nomenclature to people and culture now. It's no longer a human resource department. It's a people yeah. and culture. I've seen division. that a lot on cards now as well. It's right. Like- yeah, and there's so a whole that, variant that, of that. That's yeah. that's good. That's good. Yeah. Because you know, it's actually what the human it's what people it's a, and culture and environment. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a function, right? It's a yeah. function. The human resource department used to be called personnel, personnel yeah. management. Right? Yes. And that was basically just keeping all the documents. Yeah, you know, the CVs and the uh, mm-hmm. job descriptions and the contracts and employment contracts, all that sort of stuff, right? And just manage that. And then all of a sudden, you know, training needs became, well, where does that fit? Well, it should fit under HR because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so mm-hmm. what's happened is that the managers have abdicated their responsibility of managing people because mm-hmm. there's a human resource department that will do that for us. Right? We don't have to worry <laughs> about that. You know, so with this, when, when, when everything's going well, all my people are brilliant. When yeah. it all goes to shit, right? Oh, my people are crap, right? Yeah. And it's your and, and the, <laughs> you know, the, the human resource. I do department. love that. It's like whenever there's a problem, oh, maybe it's the people. Yeah, yeah. have you looked at your systems? <laughs> you, know, you know, so so okay, it's the human resource department's problem now to fix my problem. Right? Yeah, and it just it's it's a broken system. It doesn't work. 
So mm -hmm. you have to, as within an organization, if you're the manager of uh, in an organization, you have to take back responsibility. And this is where the performance is not it, it is on the manager, not on the individual. Because that's where when we're expanding to that, because um, that's why I was coming back to this whole measurement thing where I think that measurement side is is geared towards, most of the measurements are not geared around the people. Mm -hmm. And then when you talk about that management side as well, is there a system process training in place to let managers know, hey, part of your role as a manager is to facilitate a relationship with the employees, with the company? Yep. Is that? Yep. I, I've got a, I was at a human resource conference probably about six months ago and they were talking about psychological safety and now there's social safety. Um, and I, and, and they were talking about KPIs, mm -hmm. right? And about how businesses have this obsession about KPIs, particularly around profit. Mm -hmm. And they were going, you know, we don't like KPIs. And I went, what? <laughs> what do you mean you don't like KPIs? How do you measure? I think that comes back down to isn't it? People respect what you inspect, and people don't want <laughs> to be inspected well, to make sure they're doing their job. I, I, and, I, and I and you know that and that, it makes and me going, uncomfortable to achieve. <laughs> well, it was around the terminology, right? So they're yeah. going, we don't want people to feel pressure, okay. right? Psychologically safe. We don't like we don't want to pressure people into feeling that they have to perform. Really. And and I and I said, well, wow. isn't that isn't that a KPI? Wow, <laughs> aren't you measuring? You know, aren't you measuring psychological wow. safety? Isn't that wouldn't, a KPI? wouldn't it be a case of you'd be better off training people how to manage that right. pressure? That so just... I said, so I said, <laughs> I'm not sure that I agree with that. Right when there was a collective uh, yeah. intake, right? I said, I, I I've got a really simple solution that will solve every business's uh cultural psychological safety problem yeah. it's really simple pregnant pause everybody leans in <laughs> what is it Steve? <laughs> and and it's a really simple process but it's difficult for people to get their head around mm. because the business is not psychologically safe and the simple steps are that you make it a part of every manager's job to replace to to train at least one if not two people under their direct charge mm. to take their job yeah to be in a position 6 12 months time there's a measurement of whether this person has the capability and capacity to be able to do the job that you're currently doing mm. right now Everybody, every manager then goes, why would I ever do that, mm. right? Why would I ever train two people to take my job? And the reason they wouldn't do it is because they're afraid that their job is at risk. And if they're afraid that their job is at risk, they don't trust their employer. And if they don't trust their employer, they don't have a psychologically safe place and they're not an employer of choice. If they trust their employer that I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, the, the value of doing this yeah. is I now have three people, two or three people who are skilled and trained to do one job. Mm. So you can imagine the capacity increase now that that organization has. Yeah. Based on that, right? I can now, if I'm the manager, I can now go away on holidays and not come back to an email, you know, that's going to take me six months to clear. Mm -hmm. an, an, an inbox it means that as the manager i'm that because that presupposes then that my manager is training me to take their job correct yeah right? so it doesn't stop right correct. all the way to the managing director mm -hmm. um to to replace to be able to replace themselves that means that in the event of a promotion coming up my boss decides that they you know they're going to move on or they move up that there is, I'm capable of doing that. Mm. And when I leave, there are two people who are capable of being able to come in and reasonably quickly be able to replace me without there having to be a gap in mm. the productivity. We don't have to hire from outside, so we don't have that cost. 
people see that whole succession oh there's a there's life for me in this business to go through mm. now you get to that point and you go okay well i've trained all these people and then they leave right we spent all this money and time and effort on these people and they've left yes they have and isn't that a good thing isn't well, that a good that's thing the that presumption actually... that they've left too i mean a lot well of... <laughs> some some organiz some organizations you know they just can't satisfy the, the yeah some people will leave i mean there there will be a turnover but yeah. so your turnover is going to be a lot less if you're creating a great environment yeah and you know but in that in in that situation like where that traffic like example that i've i've told you before about yeah you know, <laughs> yeah yeah so so the you know the the concept is is to is to have multiple prongs mm going at the same time within the organization and it's not one thing you know one panacea and is that a word I, don't panacea, sure I think it, <laughs> there's not just one solution to the problem right i'm you, glad you, i know you, that because often i'm not the one who knows the word <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's 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 not and it's not easy to do right and yeah. it takes time and patience and trust because what happens is, and I went through this, you know, so I, I worked for the last three years in PNG. I worked for um, a very large security company and a, and a property a construction company that had, had a property division. Mm. And in the security company, I had the managing director and the regional director and the London H office's support in what we were doing. Right. Mm. So it was re relatively simple. It took us about six months um, and there was some pain along the way. But because we built this culture, what we started to see was customers or clients coming to us because of the reputation that we had. Our people enjoyed coming to work. They did a good job. They turned up. Yeah. Big, <laughs> you know, big surprise in Papua New Guinea. Right. Did, the, did a good job right, mm. within their skills where they weren't doing a good job. We trained them so they would do a good job. And then the customers started to go, huh, these guys actually turn up on time. They do mm -hmm. what they say they're going to do. They're reason that we weren't the cheapest, but yeah. they we were reasonably priced and we were making money and the customer was happy. And then we started to win major contracts off the back of that. And so well, that's the it point we're up. getting to with this and where I think a lot of people don't understand that. it's It might be a little bit of a slow burn, but once you build that reputation, I mean, the, the biggest expense in most businesses is finding customers, yep. you know, finding new customers. And the cheapest form of marketing is word of mouth. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, so from that perspective, what you're doing is you're creating a culture being an employer of choice is, you know, you're creating a culture where the people are really enjoying doing the work that they're doing. They turn, like you said, they turn up, but not only do they turn up, they turn up and they enjoy what they're doing. And we know from a psychological perspective, if people that enjoy what they're doing do better, <laughs> it's like, yep. um, and this is where from that perspective, you're going, well, especially in today's environment, you're going, well, I'm thinking how, can this not be your priority if you want to compete? I mean, if you're going to compete on market price, if you're going to compete on price, I mean, that's not a competitive advantage. No, it's a bit like it's a bit like offering people more money. You know, if the, if you if you offer them more money, that's what getting at, and, it's and like they look you're... somewhere else, they'll they'll offer, you know they'll go for that. Not not because they want to join me. If you're if you reduce your price as a you know to mm. attract customers then what, they'll leave you for price, right? So it's, Correct, it's and that's just what a, you said before. It's like from an employee, and that's what the, what I'm referring to is that employee mm. perspective. If you're competing on price for attracting employees, you don't have a competitive advantage to attract exactly. quality employees. Yeah, exactly. W one thing I would say is um, if, you, if you own the business mm. um, and you have control over the direction, of that it's a much easier decision to make because it's your decision right so you still need to bring your employees on board you know you might have stakeholder meetings you might um bring customers in find you know get feedback from the 
from the customers as to what's not working, all of that's a discovery, right? So that, mm. that's okay. You put a discovery in place, you design a strategy, and then you implement. That's that's normal. One of the, in larger organizations, one of the challenges are that the corporation itself doesn't have your values. Mm. So for whatever, for whatever reason, yeah. you know, you've been in that organization, you've been promoted, you, you don't feel as though you have any choice. Maybe, maybe they've got you on the hook with, you know, they're paying you a salary that you just couldn't get anywhere else, but they're asking for blood. Um, and it just, does, you know, there's a misalignment in, in the values. How do you then reconcile that mm. against your values? And this was the second experience I had in PNG with the mm. construction company is the division that I took over was losing money significantly. Right? Mm. When I looked in the numbers, it was impossible to achieve the budget based on the the revenue that we were even at a hundred percent capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, we had to be at 110% capacity to be able to achieve budget, right? Mm. Or or increase our prices, and we were we we were at sort of the top the 90th percentile in terms of price in in yep. the area. So that was it was just an unachievable. It was unachievable. So you know I had to negotiate a a, a, a re um a, a, restructuring of of our budgets and you know and we mm. were hitting around about 90 percent of the 100 percent the pre-budget right so we were overachieving our the, the restructure restructured budget we were the only division of four that was actually making money mm -hmm. in eight months and i and the reason and how i'd done that was what i'd done previously mm -hmm. right? and it's exactly the same model it wasn't wasn't anything special it was you know have a look at our systems what do we have what are the gaps that we have in our systems design and design mm -hmm. our systems appropriately uh put the people in place train them yep. deliver the outcome really simple however the the chairman of the organization didn't like what I was doing and how I was going about doing it mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Philosophically, we had different opinions of how to treat our staff. Mm -hmm. And so I had to make a decision um, on whether I would stick by my values. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and not accept his imprimatur. Now that was a difficult, that takes courage mm. to do because I couldn't, I couldn't uh, relinquish is not the right word, but, but I, I, I couldn't with all conscience mm -hmm. go back and start behaving differently with my staff who had put all of the effort in to achieve our results and all of a sudden turn up and being this Jekyll and Hyde character that all of a sudden is bashing them over the back of their head because that's how things need to be done here. Um, and and I, just, I just refused to do that and made the choice. Well, the choice was made for me because I just refused to behave in a particular way and mm. I was sacked. Right, yeah. I, I, that was good. I, I wasn't. I wasn't going to resign. Right, <laughs> there's no way in the world I was going to resign. You were not. Yeah. Going to, I know. You, you, knowing you, Steve, I know. I know. There's a little bit of stubbornness there, which I think is fabulous because it's. I can relate to that. And so, yeah, yeah. So, so if, 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 you, if, if you don't like what I'm doing, then what you, you know, then, then you, you got to get rid of me. <laughs> you got to get rid of me. Thank you very much. Very happily. And and the conversation I had with the chairman at the time was, well, I said, you know, thanks very much. You've done me a great favor. Really appreciate it. <laughs> she didn't really appreciate but anyway um yeah. so so again you know so sometimes sometimes the organization that you're working for doesn't meet your values mm. you're not happy you you make the decision to you know fall on your sword mm. 
But what I would suggest if anybody's in that situation is to build up the people that are under your charge. Don't let your values go in that space. Work, you know, with um, integrity in there. And if it looks like, if you can see the writing on the wall, then make the necessary decisions to look for an alternative before mm. you need the alternative. And because you've been, you know, really good at your job and you've, and you've had results there, it won't be long, you know, for you to be yeah. able to um, move into something that is more valuable. Now, don't That's jump from the frying pan into the fire, right? <laughs> well, that's part of the employee we're, we're talking about there from the employee going, okay, th this is not working. And, you know, I can relate to that. I had a, you know, there was a position where I was doing the role and um, what we thought was the case. And the board had a, you know, as we move forward, the board has, you know, it's come clear to me, the board had, a, our understanding was not the same as what mm. we what I thought it was at the start and it, it appeared to be from the frustration the board was having was different. So I'd made a decision saying, well, this is not working. I'm going to stand down as the CEO and um, because it's just, it's not a way yep. to work. Now, coming back to that from the employer of choice, what I noticed when I thought through that, um, you know, one of the things was I took on a role which I knew was going to be difficult and there was going to be challenges there. I was hoping, you know, there would be a little bit of change, but you know, it didn't didn't happen and that comes back to you know from that perspective of you know an, a mantra that i learned too late in life was no amount of skill fixes a poor partner choice as an employer of choice how important is it to be very clear about your values the direction and more importantly the impact that you're making when we look at the impact it's not just okay my widget does this for the person but my widget does this which has a wider impact I mean, when you look at, you know, take, um, you know, Steve Jobs with the, the first iPhones, you know, that had an impact on how we use phones, but it had a wider impact on how we connected with things as well. Mm. Is, it some, is that something that an organization needs to be looking at very carefully and going, okay, this, this is a, our values. This is how we operate. Um, this is the impact we're having. And then through their hiring choices, having a process in place where they can identify people that align that with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've nailed it right there. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually watching uh, a video of Steve Jobs when he came back, so not his original uh, tenure, yeah. when he came back and, and the, he, he re-employed the agency who had orig he'd originally, you know, they had a whole bunch of agencies come in and yeah. they were all, they were selling widgets and I forget the campaign, but it was... Um, we had the 84 campaign and he brought that marketing firm back, if that's what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was, it was was one of the best... It, uh, they had... Um, it was like make a difference or something. So they had Einstein and oh, yeah, um, yeah. JR, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Martin Luther King think, Jr. Think different. All, Think different, yeah. That yeah. that was it, you know. So so that was Which values is, and purpose, and mm -hmm. you know, being being courageous and different, and uh, and so that met their values, mm -hmm. and so therefore people were, you know, supporting that. And I think there's that that takes a different mindset, mm -hmm. um, and it takes courage amongst the. Uh, leadership, the senior executives in organize, large organizations mm. because they have a board in which they are uh, uh, responsible to. Mm -hmm. They are shareholders. They have shareholders that they're responsible to in terms of financial. And mm. it's incumbent upon them to be able to articulate the value of having values the monetary benefit of having values and how that then translates into uh, having better choices around the staff that, that you, that you employ the product that you deliver, the impact that it has on society or the economy or the ecology, you know, depending on what market you're in. And as a collective, as a, you know, as a community of business owners, um, I think it's incumbent upon us to lead that charge mm. 
Mm. It's much easier to do it if you're in a smaller business because you have control over that. But there is always the threat that, you know, you, you're making decisions that your competitors are not making. Mm-hmm. And if you get it wrong, you might lose the competitive advantage. So, you know, hasten slowly in this in, mm. in, in this space. Make sure that you're, you know, experimenting with these. I wouldn't all of a sudden, you know, drop everything that you do and run down some rabbit hole because, mm. oh, because you heard me on a podcast, right? Mm. So, you, you know, to take take your take your 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 time with this, but but hasten slowly. I, you know, it's not something that you need to do straight away. But if you don't do it in and and you haven't done anything on this in twelve months or eighteen months time, you will be left behind. Mm-hmm. Because there is a tsunami of this happening, it's, it's very early on. Um, uh, but you know, jump jump onto the wave now. There's still time to jump onto this wave. But in I reckon in two, three, four years' time, the horse will have bolted, and we will have a completely different environment that you're having to deal with. Is that? I mean, when we talk about this, because you mentioned the timing that it takes for this to happen, and it doesn't working with the culture and dealing with that doesn't happen immediately. It's not like hiring um, you know, 10 guru salespeople and sending them out and getting those immediate results, which, which happens. Um, this takes a little bit more because you're, you're dealing with the culture, you're dealing with habits, you're dealing with you know, where that, that clear direction. Now the challenge becomes in certainly with listed companies, when you've got quarterly reporting, all of a sudden you're doing these actions and things don't come through on the financial reports yet. And, you know, you're going, well, how do we, and so that's why I was coming back to that. How do we measure that? How do we deal with that? How do we put things in place where you can have that? Because I was thinking, and I'm pretty sure it's Amcor, and I need to look it up. Um, but a long time ago, uh, no, Alcoa. I think it was Alcoa. Anyway, a long time ago. It was in the 80s, I think. New CEO came in and he said, okay, we're going to focus on safety. That was his opening speech. Nothing to do with profits, nothing to do with anything yep. like that. Yep. Um, I don't know if you know that story or not, but he yep. came in and, and said, we're going to focus on safety and made that a, a priority. That was the priority. So everything became about safety. The result was because they had to do things in a different way, they had to report um, safety incidents in a different way, which required a new system for reporting but what that did was that it enabled the people within the organization to communicate better to each other because that flowed through and all of a sudden not only are they safe for operation but they're highly profitable as well um is that you know from that perspective again how do we get to that point where we have someone you know, we mentioned steve jobs or you know that that amcor if it was amcor i'll, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes um but having is it a case of you need someone that actually is going to stand up and say, actually, this is what we're going to do. Um, well, it's a little bit different from what is the standard, but this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And I would hazard a guess that when he stood up on that podium and said, you know, we're going to focus on safety, it wasn't a brain bubble that just popped into his head at that moment. Oh, no. he, he, he was hired with that intent. Right, that mm. he he that would have been part of his employment condition. Mm. I'm, you know, if I'm if you want me to change, if you want me on here, um, I I would think right. I'm I'm presuming. Yeah, that, it's a, you, it was a big public listed company. They would have to have some board, board approval. approval the, you know, that. the but he would have come in with this is my philosophy. This yeah. is what I'm doing, and that's the point I'm getting to. Is it a case of you know? having that going having people that are knowledgeable enough to say okay we're in that that situation the board would have been knowledgeable enough to hire someone who's going to take that yep and there would have been yeah and there would have been some history there potentially some previous experience that he's had so in a, at a practical level um mm-hmm. if you are a large organization my advice would be that unless yeah, unless you have this um, you know, this previous experience or knowledge of the, you know, the managing director, they're very clear on what it is that they want. They have that nutted out. They've done all of the work and it's now just an, a matter of applying that. Mm. Um, that's at a, you know, so that that's a 
you live and die by that sword, right? Yeah. S- s- some people are, are not prepared or they don't have the experience and they're experimenting. So what we used to do is we would say, give us a unit, right? Give us 20 employees mm-hmm. that where we could run, um, you know, a leadership program. We could look at their systems and processes. We could have a look at how they interact with their customers. This is what I did with the security company, right? We had 30 employees in uh, out of two and a half thousand. Mm. And we just improve their performance, right? And then mm. what happens is that because of that subtle, you know, that you see it, the, the attendance, mm. people are turning up. And when you compare the attendance to other departments, mm. you know, it w- it was significantly higher. Now, attendance in Australia may not be an issue, right? But absentee, for example, a turning up on time might not be an issue, but absenteeism may be an Hmm. of of this group we're going to spend some time we're going to spend three months working on this Let, let's measure some let's measure some um uh sorry mate the internet just went funny on me is that all right okay yep no, all no good all right, okay yeah so so you know you 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 take that you take that um uh situation and you look for improvements and experiment with those improvements prove mm. that prove that it's working and then what happens is people start to see that as evidence what are you doing over there what could we do in our department to reflect that right mm. so that's that if you don't have that champion at the head what you can do is you can as you can experiment um, to see whether, in fact, you you have these, uh, you can you can make an impact in a particular area, um, and that goes for you know if if you're running a small business and you don't have any experience in this area, engage a consultant, mm. right? Engage someone who is experienced in this place that can guide you through this area. Um, and you know, there's coaches who work on mindset and all that. And if you need that, then great. But I'm talking about a consultant who, like you or I, right, who have got experience in this space. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. It may not be exactly, for, mm. uh, you know, in every industry, but you put in place this mechanism. You play with it. You experiment with it. You find out what works, what doesn't work. And then, then it becomes a part of your process, right? The consultant should be training your people to be able to do this on their own. You know, any consultant that is in a in a job for more than you know twelve months on a particular project is probably not the right consultant. <laughs> From that perspective, though, how much of that falls into this? I mean, you talk about the time period. It's the patience and understanding and having, I don't want to use the word faith, but I just did, so I'm going to use it. <laughs> but it, And I put the faith in that category. I suppose faith is not the right word because it's not, it's when you have that knowledge and you, you experience, you know that this takes a little bit of time, that through these steps, this change will happen. Mm. And I know that through you know the exceptional effort, continuous improvement module that I implement in companies where we have you know a process and it's you have a lot of people at the start that don't turn up that's just because it's the way that goes and it becomes not about you know whether they turned up or not at the start and it's always the same i find i reckon there's one person that's following me around it's this metrosexual guy because doesn't turn up then he does turn up and sits at the back he's got his tight shirt on (laughs) sitting with his arms crossed um, and then by within about, it's it's actually not that long, I think, between you know, six to eight weeks, all of a sudden he's starting to contribute re- and really well. And I find create once you create that process, is it creating when, from an organization perspective, when you were talking about creating this um, employer of choice, being an employer of choice and creating the culture where you are that, it's having that understanding that these things take a little bit of time and you need to give it that time to actually to happen because we know change takes, what, 28 times roughly repeating it. 
and you know in an organization you're not doing it every day i mean they say 28 days because they're allowing one repetition a day an organization you're not doing one repetition a day you, you need to be doing that you know it takes a little bit longer is mm. it is it part of that and then i'm going to come back to that whole reporting process of going okay let's have let's be clear about what our values are we're here now we need to get to here um so we're going to take that the process and have a reporting method so that we're allowing a realistic time frame for that change to happen yep I, I love the people who come in and are not a part of the echo chamber i love mm. them because mm. they're the ones who are actually going to stress test mm. the the they're not going to sit there and go yes 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 sir you know either because they don't want you know the boss has made the decision that the consultant's there Mm. Right. So I need to follow whatever the consultant says, right? Whether yeah. I believe it or don't believe it. I yeah. actually love the ones who go, why are we doing this? What, what uh, I'm mm. sitting back with my arms crossed. I don't want to know anything about this. They're the yeah. doubters because they, they actually stress test what you actually are, are offering, right? So mm. it's actually a good thing. They're the ones who will give you the nuggets of gold. That's not going to work. Why won't it work? Well, we tried that five years ago. Okay, what were the circumstances that you mm. that you applied it then? Well, was that okay? Was that the same as now? No, it's not. Or yes, it is. Okay, well, that's good. No, that's good to know, right? That's great mm -hmm. intel. Uh, someone who goes, yes, let's do it, right? Because it's your great idea. And then in the back of their head going, we tried that five years ago, right? Never going to work, but we're going to do it anyway because, you know, you're the consultant. What, what do I know? So yeah. I, I, I love, I, you know, I love all of that. Um, I, I think the other thing that, and I'm not, I don't want to be a consultant basher, but I think what a, a lot of the times uh, our industry the value of us is that we can actually help you grow or or improve or you know you're broken we're here to fix you this mm. arrogance that we have uh, as consultants thinking that we're the only ones that can help you no your your business is successful you are a successful business mm. you know you're making profits you're looking you, you know the fact that we're involved with you is that you are looking to improve so i i, I think what What's incumbent upon us is to is to honor what has made the business successful, allow mm. that to continue, look for improvements within within the organization. And I'm and I'm I say, you know, if we had a five percent improvement, man, that is out of the world. I know that some people talk about 28, 38, 48 percent improvements. I don't know. I've never been in a I've never it been happens, in an organization. but you can't. It's not going to happen every year. No, you know, I, 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 <laughs> that's not. So that I, I, goes, I work around the I work around the edges, right? Yeah. I, I go, okay, well, you know, if we make a three percent improvement over there or a five percent improvement collectively, it might be a fifteen or twenty percent improvement. But I'm looking for edges, and I'm looking for quick wins, because what happens? Mm -hmm. you, you're looking for a quick win, something that you can do relatively simply that has got exposure or leverage in other areas yeah that there is not a lot of resistance to and everybody gets on board quickly that's something that you can do within a month or six weeks right and people then go oh there's evidence now to support the theory mm. we did this we got a result oh let's do that again right let's change right. management okay. 101 isn't it <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> So it's uh. change, you know, change, is, change is hard. Change is hard. People don't like it. Why are we changing this? And it's not until well, they actually People only see complain it. about two things, the way things are and change. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. So um, look, it's not it's not hard, but it's... Well, that's the thing. It isn't hard. It's we not easy. Hard, I, believe. It, it, I think we yeah, make it, it hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and again, you know, it's like anything. How do you need an elephant? One bite at a time and you chew that mm. like crazy, right? It's, <laughs> I, I think the biggest, the biggest yeah, thing is, <laughs> I think the biggest challenge that business owners have is the impatience or the, or the unrealistic expectation. Mm. So a manager in an organization, can you change this? Yes, I can. Well, how long is it going to take you? Well, how long do you want it to be? Right, it's it's like, it'll extend you know, to the time period you allow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 you know you tell yeah. you tell whoever you know you want 
to keep the gig or have the gig, right? Yeah. Whereas I, my approach is, well, what's your, you know, what, what's the outcome that you want? What's the budget that you've got? What's the mm. internal capability and capacity that you have to be able to make that change? Here's the realistic outcome that you're going to get mm. as a result of that. Are you happy with that? Yes, you are. No, you're not. Well, if, you're, if it's no, you're not, and you want more, then the person down the road is going to tell you what you want to hear. And guess what? In six months' time, you're going to have blown the budget and you're not going to get what you want. So, sorry. Well, that's a different but I mean, this that's is a whole the truth. Another topic of, you know, that personal um, accepting of, of where the situation is, accepting the reality. Um, but, you know, from an employer of choice perspective is is recognizing i think it is coming to the fore now i mean people are getting a handle on the demographics are not the same you can't just go and do what it is and you can't just throw money at it because one you've got to get the money from somewhere to start with yep. um, and usually if you're in that situation you don't have a lot to spare um so this i mean if we're going to wrap it up employer of choice when we look at it I, from what I've seen, a lot of people tend to think about this stuff as being a cost to business. But is it really? Is it more about this is actually where the heart and soul of you actually being profitable long term rests? Is that mm. the case? If you're going to wrap it up, how would you sum that up? Yeah. I mean, we often hear people say, you know, our people are our greatest assets. Mm. Right. And so where do they, if they're an asset, where are they on the balance sheet? Mm. Um, but they actually sit the in the liability section because they're an expense. Um, and yeah. so therefore, so it's a mindset shift. You know, if your people are in fact your greatest asset and you mm -hmm. want to improve the viability of that asset, and you want it to grow or you know be sustainable or however you want to describe it. Mm. Um, it's what are you prepared to invest in that asset to improve it and maintain it, right? So you, we, we spend more money as businesses maintaining our machinery than mm. we do maintaining the machinery called people, right? <laughs> it's like there's a maintenance program on people. You know, what, what, what are you doing to maintain your people? Not, not improve them, maintain them because, mm -hmm. you know, in this developing world, what, what they knew three years ago is almost irrelevant to what they're, you're asking them to do now because mm -hmm. of, you know, computation changes, because of industry, uh, you know, the environment that they're in, the market that they're in, all of these changes, you need to be able to maintain your people so that they're keeping up with that. And then if you want to improve them, you know, then there's this, what can we do to help you to improve? So it's a mind shift then of, do I see this as an, as an expense and I, am I bitter because of it? Mm. And, I, you know, every time I write the, the, well, no one writes checks anymore, but each time I approve the. the I remember the, checks. It's okay. You can go there. <laughs> um, you know, each time I. I got one the other day. Did you? Yeah, I got, I got a got... check in the mail. It was, um, and it wasn't some, someone didn't say you've got the check in the mail. Just and, and there's, no <laughs> tell, there's no teller to accept it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. you got to actually punch it in through the ATM. And I slid uh, it in the ATM the wrong way around. It kept rejecting it. And oh, hang on a minute, the number's got to go on the other side. Yeah. yeah. So you know, like it, 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 it is really a mindset. I, I, I might just add um, the other thing that I think is really being uh, people are being challenged is this idea of uh, age. Uh, you know, and young mm -hmm. people not being able, you know, not not having the right attitude towards work and all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, I, I said, oh, these are your children, right? <laughs> not necessarily, not necessarily the people who are employed by you, but you had children and your children are like that, right? I know yeah. I've got a 30, you know, 30, 28 year old, 24 year old and a 22 year old. And I know how they behave, right? And so when people say to me, my, you know, this 20-year-old who turns up and, you know, they want this and they're expecting this, and I go, and you're surprised because? 
Mm. I, do you not know that this is how this <laughs> this this, in, this group is behaving? It's your fault, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Right? it's your fault. You you raise them. So how yeah. are you? What are you changing in your mindset? to encourage these kids, to motivate them, to inspire them, to Mm. get them to enjoy coming to work. And it's not a drudgery because they look at your life and they go, no friggin' way I want to turn out like that. That's Mm. boring. That is like, you know, you've worked your entire life and you've got what? You're bitching about your job every day, right? I don't want that. So... What are you going to do as an employer, as a person, to encourage not, you know, all of your people? Mm. How are you going to support them? And that's a completely different mindset on that. And that's a that whole nother subject for a whole nother discussion. But well, it's, exactly it's the shift. It's a shift. And that mindset shift. And this is where I'm wondering because I know I have some material around this that i use that's where i come back to that reporting side of things and what you hit on there and said that the employee is an asset they are an asset but we don't report it that way as you highlighted we certainly don't because realistically i mean from an accounting perspective you buy a machine um, it provides some value you depreciate it when it no longer works goes off the balance toss it you, out. you toss it out but the, the employee and this is where you know you and i understand that and certainly have some reporting around that is that the employee comes in as an asset and then if you invest in that asset the asset increases in value yep so and sometimes that's how that doesn't. reporting well sometimes but so, sometimes theory, it doesn't right and, yeah, and so yeah, that's when you I, need to refer them to your competition well, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't want the i don't want the listener to think that this is some sort of nirvana or utopia right so it, it's a bit like you well know, they've got to do the kids. work the employee's got to do the work yeah yeah so it's like, it's like raising kids right so you you hope that you raise your kids to be good people right you would hope right that's everybody's intention do they do they behave well all the time no no sometimes they're little shits right sometimes i'm a shit yeah so so it's it's having that having that i'm not going to admit to it publicly (laughs) you know so read that answer for what it is (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah. you're in a different situation right you, you, anyway we won't, we won't go a little shit we, we won't we won't go there we won't go there. but but you know what i mean so so you are you less do you love them any less when they're when they're not behaving well mm. no you you still love them right but you're just not proud of their behavior and you have a conversation sometimes they are very difficult conversations go to your room do not come out right you are you are grounded give me your phone all of those you know tantrums and screaming matches and everything right but you you're doing it out of love right Mm -hmm. you're doing it because you care for your loved ones yeah take that same mental attitude into how you communicate with people around you at work in your social life right is that you care about these people and Mm -hmm. the reason you are spending time with them and building up trust with them Mm -hmm. so that when you have that difficult conversation and there will be difficult conversations there's no doubt about it right they will misbehave or you'll do something that you have to apologize for and it will be awkward and difficult and it's because you've spent that time building that long that re- relationship and trust that you can actually have that conversation and say you know what Damien not happy mm. your behavior in the last month man it is change what's going on Mm -hmm. what's happening in your life that is causing you to behave like this Mm -hmm. it's not what i've done right it's not it's not oh like is there something that i've done as your employer no Mm -hmm. i need you to tell me what's changed in your life because right at the moment i'm not very proud of you i you know i'm not happy with the performance and i as your employer as your boss as your manager i want to see how i can support and help you 
mm. to overcome this. Right? Mm. That's that's my job is to help and overcome, that. not to solve your problem, right? But be aware of how I how I can help and support solve you to do your job appropriately. And I'll give you as many chances as is possible to be able to do that. But if you choose not to, mm. if you make the decision, no, you know, screw you, I'm going to do this or, you know, or whatever, whatever, the, whatever that is, okay, that's your choice. Yeah. What you're and- talking about there is creating that psychological safety. Not here's a petition patient medal if i can say that participation medal because you showed up but hey um you're you are of value to this organization and we're here to support you be the best that you can be and you have a part to play in that too yep and you know when you've got a really great relationship when people come to you first yeah you're not going to them and saying (laughs) hey what's going on they're coming to you saying Damien, listen, mate, I'm really struggling with this. Mm. I've got these problems at home or I've got money problems or I've got time problems or I'm just, I'm feeling burnt out. I'm not enjoying what I do. Um, I don't know what to do. And it's affecting my work mm. and I need your help. Now and that makes you an employer of choice. That makes you an employer of choice. Yeah, I love that. Steve, it is always wonderful chatting with you. So knowledgeable. You've got so much experience. Um, Thank you very much for making the time for being on Growing Revenue and Profit. It's been wonderful. My entire pleasure. Love this subject. Could talk about it for another hour. But thank you very, really do appreciate the opportunity, Damien.